trying something a bit different today. We're in the training school and we, uh, in the background you can see that there will some, be some officers being trained, particularly with uh, road safety. Uh, and that's one of the subjects that we'll be, we'll be covering today. So what we're do going to do today is that I will be asking um, Chief Constable Andy Marsh, thank you for joining us, about some of the questions that you've raised uh, that, that you're concerned about. And it's all part of being accessible and transparent. And that's what So it's a, a, a wide range, but I think that does reflect the sheer um, differences that the police make mm. to different sectors of our, of our, our society. So let's just start to the neighbourhood policing and the precinct. So as you know,
there isn't much um, patrolling um, where people are not tasked with incidents at the moment, I'm afraid. Sure. And presumably that's going to be for the next few months? Uh, certainly for the summer. Um, and I'm considering all of the options that I could take and need to take to make sure that we spend our time doing the most important things. Now, I think the public uh, watching our communities would always be concerned about their neighbourhood, their incidents. We have to be concerned where there's limited resource about the incidents where there's a threat of harm or a threat to life or a threat to vulnerable people. And um, so there will be a lot of prioritisation going on over the summer and I'll certainly be looking to work with you, Sue, to communicate what that might mean in practical terms. Yeah, and can I just say on behalf of local people, I'd like to just take this moment to thank uh, officers because you know we, we, we're enjoying glorious weather and and it's in it, it's it's very hot to work but also to have had have plans cancelled like that and put the public first I think is is why they're joined policing but it is still very it's a tough ask for them and their families it's a big ask I checked to an officer this morning and asking whether she was able to take some leave this summer uh, and she can't we, we can't we simply can't give her any time off and so I, I can't take that for granted and I, I can't do it forever if you see what I mean yeah yeah so let's just move on to recruitment police officer recruitment as you know the um, one of the priorities is making sure that the constabulary have the right kit the right culture and the right people and I've also set the challenge of improving the diversity of the of the workforce and, and I'm delighted that recruitment is now open and I hope anyone's listening that, you know, that they will consider um, joining the constabulary. But what are you looking for in, in, in your police officers? So because of the um, funds that are available through the precept increase, we are able to recruit. That's fantastic news. Uh, it's really important to bring new skills and new people into an, any organisation. So we're, we're looking for people that can do practical things and people who can take statements, um, arrest suspects, deal with conflict and confrontation. Um, actually, the, those, are, those are tasks. The sort of people that we're looking for are, I, I would say that there's some key things. First of all, uh, vocationally minded. They want to make a difference in society to make things better. They want to serve other people. We need people who care. Uh, they care about each other, they care about the communities they, mm. they serve in, and that backs up the vocational aspect. We want people who are prepared to learn, uh, I'm Chief Constable, I've been in policing for over 30 years and I learn a lot every day and I've much more to learn and that's why I'm still in policing. It's a wonderful career for anyone um, to, who, who, want, who wants to learn. And then I think the final thing we're looking for is courageous people. And I'm not always talking about physical courage, obviously there is some danger and confrontation for which people are very well tra trained, very well equipped, but the most difficult aspects of courage are moral and ethical courage, about doing the right thing mm -hmm. uh, all the time. So. We are um, a, an organisation that is here for our communities. Now in terms of the representative element, the British policing, which is low on numbers, high on accountability, routinely unarmed, and thank goodness for all of this stuff, I wouldn't want to be involved in, in it if it wasn't. Mm. It, 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 take, it only works because of the consent and support of the public legitimacy. Now our, our populations have changed massively over the last 10, 20, 30 years, and they'll change again. But actually we're not representative of our whole communities and we're everyone's police. Everyone needs to look at us and say, well, I could be part of them. Uh, they're here to serve me. I, I trust them. I have confidence in them. Now, the, an essential route to that is that we're representative of our communities. And that, of course, is in terms of gender. Um, it's in terms of religion, race, ethnicity, sexuality, disability. We, we, we are everyone's police force. So um, we would want people who perhaps haven't considered joining over in some sense say, well, I, I, well, I'm interested in what you said. I'm going to have another look at that. Mm. And there's there's other opportunities. Um, if you know being an officer or PCSO wasn't uh, you know wasn't something you wanted to do, there's there's there's, there's staff opportunities as well. So people can come in and and uh, work in lots of different capacities. So we're we're always recruiting for our call handlers. Uh, we deal with almost a million calls a year, and you don't know what the next one's going to be about. A, an incredibly stretching and demanding job. So we're always recruiting there. But we employ IT specialists, analysts, HR professionals, finance professionals, lawyers. We employ over 2,000 police staff in a whole variety of roles, investigators, roles, investigators, detention officers. So there, there is something for everyone in policing. And if you just fancy a look and you want to make a difference, then my commitment to you, if we're able to raise the precept next year, amongst many other things, we commit that we will have 50 additional special constables. So we have lots of volunteering opportunities in uniform and out of uniform. Okay, that's really interesting. Let's move on to uh, motorway closures. Now I'm sure 
you like me have sat for probably many hours on the motorway with it being closed and nothing can be more frustrating and in fact many people have contacted me about you know where is the impetus to reopen that motorway as, as, as soon as possible so can you tell me about some of the, the recent work that the constabulary has been doing with, with Highways England regarding motorway conditions? So because this is such an important issue to uh, our communities, the people we serve, our economy, this is something that you've pushed me very hard to resolve and, and I know to be personally involved in. So there are there are many agencies that get involved in road closures. Uh, highways, the Highways Authority, the Highways Agency have a primary responsibility around maintaining the um, uncongested flow of traffic mm -hmm. on our major routes such as motorways and so we've worked very closely with them with fire and rescue with local authorities and voluntary agencies to come up with trigger plans and protocols about how we will respond to blockages um, collisions or obstructions in the highway and we've got a new protocol which has been introduced uh, in this force area and I think it's so so widely regarded by the partners that have been involved it's being looked to roll out nationally. Mm. So we're, we're actually with that at the moment. I think the thing to remember though is, um, if there is a death or a serious collision on the motorway, then actually we do need to deal with the obstruction. We do need to investigate for the bereaved families, for the people involved, uh, uh, as well as the safety of us, or generally road users. There, there will be delays, which we're absolutely committed to minimize. If we ever shut the motorway, I regard that as significantly, so significantly important that one of my chief officers will be notified immediately we shut the motorway. I mean, it, you know, closing the motorway impacts on our economy, mm. it impacts on everyone's plans, you could be vulnerable sitting in your car as well. So mm. there is, what sort of advice would you give to, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here dreading thinking that we could have a motorway closure for some time, sometime today, but I mean, what advice would you give to, to motorists? Um, well, be prepared, you know, that's a mm. scout motto, isn't it? So yeah. if, if, if you're driving in winter, then we would suggest take, take warm clothing, take a flask, take some snacks. But if you're driving at, th at this time of year, you know, heaven forbid there was a, a serious delay, you'd be needing um, water and, and some sustenance. Um, so we, we, we would say um, try, and, try and be calm. We will be dealing with it with those other agencies. Stay tuned to local radios and use social media, which we use incredibly proactively to push out information. Um, about what's happening uh, with highway obstructions. We also, with Highways uh, Authority and local partners, now use all sorts of um, modern satellite um, traffic technology to help inform us which routes are moving slowly and which ones um, are moving better, mm -hmm. so that we, we will get you to the fastest route, be assured of that. The problem with the southwest is one significant yeah. rose in and out of it. Yeah. Someone who's, who, who grew up in Cornwall and holidays there with my, my parents when I can, that, that does present us with difficulties at one major route. Yeah, and, and you know, we, 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 I'm very much aware that with the M4, M5 interchange, the A23, we've got some significant holiday routes. Yeah, we are. So let's keep fingers crossed. Yeah, well, we'll do, it, we'll do our best, and I know that it's something um, that the, the next call after the Gold Commander rings me up to say we've got a problem on the M5. It's usually from you, so ask yeah. me what's happening. <laughs> let's move on to honour based abuse and forced marriage. The National Police Chief Council has defined honour based abuse as an incident or crime involving violence, threats of violence, t intimidations, coercion or abuse, which has or may have been committed to protect or defend the honour of an individual family and or community for alleged or perceived breaches of the family or community code of behaviour. Now this is a really difficult crime to get your head around. And it's also an incredibly difficult crime for victims to report. How much of, do you think this is an issue locally? So we, we, we take reports of honour-based violence, relatively no numbers, uh, around about 60 a year. Um, but but we, we believe that it's a much more prevalent problem than that, at much higher rates of honour-based violence, because it involves um, personal, private, family matters, um, issues which people think they might not be free to report because of the risk and consequences of, of doing that. And so, linking back to some of our representative community workforce discussions, it's really important that we're trusted by the whole community to deal sensitively with these situations. So relatively low levels, but very sensitive, very difficult and time consuming cases to deal with, very high intensity there, um, but we think much bigger volumes than we hear about. Okay, so as far as um, forced marriage protection orders, does this mean if you use them that you actually, that someone will be separated from their family? So that, that's just one tactic. Um, that we can use to protect people and we, we, we will significantly be led by 
what a victim wants us to do right. around any crime. Um, domestic abuse uh, and issues such as forced marriage can be tricky issues because sometimes people are in such a position they might not be able to make the best decision to protect themselves. So sometimes we will want to take some action, but we are victim-led. The forced marriage protection order, we took one last year, we've taken one this year, it doesn't mean that you'll be separated from your family, okay. necessarily. E each order is absolutely case-by-case -case basis. Very specific to very, that very specific It's absolutely bespoke based on reasonable grounds, necessity and proportionality. I've spoken to a number of victims um, of honour-based abuse and for some they're not ready yet to report to the police. What can they do? Well, just because they report it um, to the police doesn't mean that we're going to clumsily jump in and, and take their life away from them. Um, so we, we would encourage them to start engaging with their local police. And we one of the benefits of having a neighbour team in, in every area is that you've got known and visible officers and PCSOs that, that can actually give lots of informal advice. So the, there are lots of other ways um, which people can be helped. So one of the initiatives that you created when you became PCC was Lighthouse, a, a um, multifaceted team there to support victims of crime, but people who open doors to many other, many, many other agencies mm, around mm. domestic abuse, honour-based violence, all, all sorts of issues. So a actually we, we can refer people on to uh, charitable and third sector organisations that will give, give help, like Nextlink in Bristol, just yeah. one of many. Yeah. Now before we finish, um, I was reading the Sunday Times and there was um, an article about Bath and the fact that there had been what seemed to be an enormous surge of, of robberies and, uh, and also the um, violent offences. What can you do to reassure Bath residents that, um, who obviously have some real concerns? Yeah, it, it was a concerning piece. Um, I feel a frustration sometimes with the, the crime statistics and figures so that they're only newsworthy when they're sensational and bad. Um, if they were good, people would say, well, I don't believe them. There must be another story. Um, so the, the levels of violent crime and robbery have risen since 2013 to 2017 in Bath. And that, that's a picture that is familiar with many of the police forces and towns across the whole country. I think that was the tenor of the, the mm, piece. Mm. We, we, we have witnessed uh, a change in levels of crime. We have changed the way that we record crime. So when I took up this position at the start of 2016, 30% of our crime wasn't being efficiently recorded. Well, we're now we're now losing, as it were, very, very few crimes. So we've, we've closed that gap, and the biggest area we've closed is violent crime. Right. So that, that's a little bit of the explanation. Now, now on, on to Bath, it's a world heritage city. It's a, a beautiful place. It's where I started my policing, so I know, I know it very well. So I've got close to these figures. In 2017, we uh, conducted an, an exercise to deal with some uh, drug dealing. We call it a county lines problem, where people sometimes are forced, young people, into dealing drugs, or they're attracted by money. Uh, they come from uh, other places, London significantly, uh, and deal drugs. It, it, is, it is a criminality that causes a lot of harm around violence. We, we have, at this, time, at this specific time, I think it's appropriate to say, got over 60 of those networks recorded in our force area. It's a very significant mm. national problem. So we were experiencing in Bath, and last year we did some covert uh, operations, um, some very sophisticated techniques, and we made many, many arrests. In fact, uh, one morning I turned up in September in Bath at 5 a.m. to conduct some warrants with my officers. Now, th those individuals that we arrested, I believe, were responsible for creating that, that climate where there was more street crime. Now, we haven't, we haven't solved the problem. We've certainly suppressed it. So this year, the levels of violent crime and robbery have, in Bath so this current financial year, 10% lower than last year. So I would say with a bit of confidence that what we did helped. And we haven't finished that job. We've got a local police chief, um, Steve Kendall. He's got dedicated uh, beat managers and PCSOs, uh, the, the roles mm -hmm. that you've protected, that are visible and present in Bath and working with our communities to tackle it. So what I would say is that, that actually I'm, a, I'm aware of these issues. We, we feel we're onto it. And uh, I would want people in Bath to have confidence that it's a, a beautiful city, a safe city that, that we have a very, very visible police presence in. Thank you for that. And I think uh, going forward over this next year, certainly um, trying to tackle county lines and the cuckooing of particularly vulnerable people is something that we will need to do more work on. It, it certainly, if we are able to um, create any additional resources, it would have been area along with burglary of people's houses, I would be I'm looking to try and support you with some proactive work and ideas about how we could improve our service and tackle that criminality which touches um, pretty much
touch all of our communities either directly or indirectly. Okay, thank you for that. So I think that's that's a, a quick gallop of through some of those questions. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, I, I, I think it's going to be uh, a hot summer. Um, I hope that the England's football run continues soon. Mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed that, but those times create uh, additional demand for, for the, the police and the police staff and PCSO. So if you see an officer standing on a, a cordon dealing with an accident, you're able to take a glass of water out. Um, that would be a fantastic act of kindness. So thank you to our community supporting us. Thank you. And thank you if you've enjoyed uh, listening to um, me as the PCC holding the Chief Constable Andy Marsh to account. Uh, if you've got some questions that you want us to, um, to, to raise in our, our next session, which is in October, then please do so. This is all to do with being open and accessible. Um, the police service belong to you, and therefore that's what I'm doing on your behalf. So thank you for listening, and uh, hope to see you next time.